Hi there, Mr. Sutton here with this lesson on Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Graphical Analysis. In this one, we'll be using the FTC to analyze graphs. For a warm-up on this one, if we're given a graph of f prime of x, what information does that give us about the graph of f of x? Uh, so go through each of these and see if you can fill in the blanks. All right, let's see how this went. So where f prime of x is above the x-axis, positive in other words, the original function f is increasing. Where f prime is below the x-axis or negative, f is decreasing. If f prime crosses the x-axis from positive to negative, then the original function has a local maximum there. And if we're going from negative to positive, then the original had a local min. If f prime is increasing, f is, well, that's going to be concave up, right? Because if f is increasing, f double prime is positive. So that means the original function's got to be concave up. And where f prime is decreasing, when your slope is uh, going down, then f itself is concave down. If f prime changes from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa, then the original has a point of inflection, because this is a sign change in f double prime. And finally, the area under f prime tells us how much the original function value is changing. That is the change in whatever f is. Now that we've got that little f f prime relationship review under our belts, let's tackle a few examples. All of our examples are going to rely on this graph right here with this little problem stem. So familiarize yourself with this problem. So we've got a continuous function, f, defined over negative 4 to 3. We've got some line segments. We've got a semicircle. And then we have some function, g, which happens to be the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt. So based off of this, see if you can figure out the values of g of negative 4 and g of 3. And just so you know, I'm going to do g of 3 first because that's the easier of the two. All right, let's see if you figure out what to do with these. Uh, so for g of 3, we're just plugging 3 in for x up here. So we're doing the integral from 1 to 3 of f of t dt, which essentially means we're finding the area under the curve of f in this graph. So if I'm going from 1 to 3, I've got this triangular shape that I'm trying to find the area of. And it's also under the x-axis. So if I'm going to the right and I have area under the x-axis, that's going to be negative area. So I'm going to be doing negative 1 half times a base of 2 times a height of 1. And if this is a free response and you just needed to find g of 3, you don't actually need to simplify this any further for this part of the problem. Um, but we could. This would end up being negative 1. It's going to turn out that that's helpful later on in this particular problem. So let's do g of negative 4 now. So this is the integral from 1 to negative 4 of this function here. Now we have to be careful because we are going from 1 backwards. So that means that whatever the sign of our area would have been going from left to right, we now have to negate that sign. So the first area we have to deal with is this semicircle area right here. So this is going to be uh, 1 half times pi r squared. So 1 half times pi times 1 squared gives us the basic area. We're going backwards. So initially, this is negative. But it's also area that's under the x-axis. So that further negates it. Um, so we have a negative for going backwards and a negative for being under the x-axis. That makes this positive area at the end of the day. So positive 1 half pi times 1 squared. All right, next we have the area under this curve here. Now this isn't quite a complete triangle, but there is a triangular piece right here. So for this triangle, we have area that would normally be positive because it's above the x-axis, but again, you're going right to left. So this is end up this is going to end up being negative area, negative 1 half times 1 times, this will be a 3. And now we have one more area, that's a trapezoid right here. So we got all the shapes covered on this problem. And this is again going to be negative area because it's above the x-axis, but you're going to the left. So this is going to end up being, we have a base of, let's see, 1 plus 3 over 2 times a height of 2 for that trapezoid. And again, you don't have to simplify this on a free response. But if we wanted to, this is going to be, let's see, uh, pi over 2 when all the dust settles. And for these parts over here, this ends up being, let's see, this is negative 3 over 2. And this ends up being, this is, let's see, 8 over 2, negative 8 over 2. So this is negative 11 over 2. There we go. For the next part of this problem, 
we're trying to figure out g prime and g double prime of negative three. Um, so based on your fundamental theorem of calculus and this g function here, see if you can figure these out. All right, now the key on this problem is realizing that when you take the derivative of both sides of this equation they gave you, you end up with g prime equaling f of x. So in order to find g of negative three, you're really just trying to find f of negative three. And f is given right on the graph here, um, so we just have to look up the y value when x is negative three. So that's right here. Now we've got a slope of one if you just count squares here. Um, you can see that this is a y value of two, and you actually don't need to show any other work. You just need to state that the y value is two there. All right, how about g double prime? Well, g double prime, since g prime is f, g double prime is f prime, which is to say the slope of the f function. So if we're asking for g double prime of negative three, we're asking for the slope of this graph at negative three. And you actually could just read that off the graph without showing any work, but if you wanted to show a little bit of work like I did, we could say we've got a slope of, let's see, this is three minus one for the y values, negative two minus negative four or plus four for the x values. So that ends up being two over two, which is one. For part C, we're asking for the x-coordinate at each point at which the graph has a horizontal tangent line, the graph of G now. Uh, and for each of these, determine if it's a relative min, max, or neither, and then justify your answers. Um, so again, using your fundamental theorem in the connection between G and F, see if you can figure this one out. All right, so we again know that G prime is really F of X. And if we're looking for where G has a horizontal tangent line, we're asking where g prime takes on a value of zero. Well, where does it take on a value of zero? Well, wherever f takes on a value of zero. So that's gonna be the x-intercepts for the f function on the graph here. That happens at negative one and positive one. So now we have to look at these spots and figure out if these are relative mins, maxes, or neither. And to do that, we're gonna look at what the graph of f is doing in terms of signs. Um, because we're really asking about the sign of g prime. So we see at negative one, g prime, which is to say f, changes from positive to negative. So that means that g is going to have a relative max at x equals negative one because of our first derivative test here. And then we see over here at positive one, g prime or f does not change sign at all. It changes from negative back to negative. It just bounces here. So because there's no sign change, there is no extremum for g at x equals one. For part d, we want to find all values of x at which the graph of g has a point of inflection and explain our reasoning. Um, so pause the video, see where you can get on this one. All right, now again, we're starting with the idea that g prime equals f of x. And we can figure out where g has a point of inflection by looking at whether uh, g prime is increasing versus decreasing at various spots. So for example, we see that g prime, which is again the graph of f, is going from increasing to decreasing at x equals negative two, and actually also at x equals one. And we see that the graph of f, or g prime, is going from decreasing to increasing down here at x equals zero. That one's kind of easy to miss because it's a smooth turnaround instead of one of these sharp turn turnarounds. Um, but since we have increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, that means we have points of inflection for g at x equals negative two, zero, and one. Now, another way you could have justified points of inflection is by talking about the sign of g double prime. Um, but if you're gonna talk about sign changes in g double prime, you have to first define g double prime. Now, we actually defined it back in part C as being f prime, um, so you could talk about it that way, but I think it's easier if you just go straight to this whole increasing, decreasing, because you can easily read that off the graph. For this problem, part E, we're actually gonna go through this one together. Here, we're trying to find an x value where the g function here attains its maximum value from negative four to three. Now, it's worth noting that we're guaranteed to find an absolute max by the extreme value theorem because we have a closed interval and the g function has to be continuous since f is continuous. f is continuous, that means that g is differentiable, which implies that it's continuous. Um, so anyway, let's start looking for that absolute max. Now there's two options we actually have on this. 
Um, option number one you're familiar with, at least with non-graphical problems, and that is the candidates test, where you have to plug in and compare both the endpoints and the critical values. And just whichever one's the highest is going to be our absolute max. So we'll work through this one first, and then I'll show you another way of doing this. So uh, in terms of things that we're plugging in, we're definitely going to have to plug in negative 4 and 3. Now, the good news is you actually found g of negative 4 and g of 3 on part A of this big problem. So we're saving ourselves a little bit of work there. Um, but what else are we going to have to figure out? Well, critical values, that's going to be any place where g prime equals 0. Now, remember, g prime is f of x. So we might have to test out anywhere where this f function crosses the x-axis. For example, at negative 1 and positive 1. So are these both really candidates for being an absolute max? You could test them both out, um, but it turns out you actually don't need to test x equals 1. This is not going to be a local max. x equals negative 1, at least g prime is changing from positive to negative there. Um, but this one over here, uh, we're not going positive to negative. We're going negative to negative. If something is not a local max and it's, it's in between the endpoints, if it's not the highest value, at least in its immediate area, there's no way it's going to be the absolute value for the whole graph. Um, so how do we get out of testing x equals 1? So the way I do this is I say that g prime equals f of x changes from positive to negative only at x equals negative 1. That's my short way of spelling out for the 8p graders that, hey, this is a local max, so I'm not going to bother testing anything that's not a local max. Um, so if you do this kind of language, all you have to test is negative 1, at least for the interior points. Um, so let's go through all of them now. So just doing a little bit of a flashback here. For part A, this was part A, remember you found that g of negative 4 was pi over 2 minus 11 over 2, and g of 3 was negative 1. So we're just going to write those again, just so we have those down here, um, because you really want to have these all in the same place when you're comparing them. And now we still need to find g of negative 1. Uh, so pause the video and go ahead and find that. Now g of negative 1, that's the integral from 1 to negative 1. So that's really just this area going backwards here from 1 to negative 1. Well, that's this little semicircle that was negative because we were going left, but also negative because we were below the x-axis, and the negative negative made this positive. Um, so this is again going to be positive 1 half pi 1 squared, uh, or essentially just positive pi over 2. So now we compare them. Well, pi over 2 is a positive, negative 1 is negative. Um, the positive is going to be higher than the negative, so negative 1 is no good. Now we have to compare pi over 2 and this other expression here. Well, if I have a number and that same number minus something that's a positive being subtracted, um, I think we can agree that the number that doesn't have stuff being subtracted is going to be higher. So then we can say that our absolute max occurs at x equals negative 1. Now, the nice thing about the candidates test is if they actually ask you for the maximum value and not just the x value where it occurs, well, you've already got the value calculated there, so you just have to point to it and say absolute max. Um, let's t check out another way of doing this, though. Another way to show where we have an absolute max on this graph is with something I like to call the lonely extreme test. The basic idea of this test is if your derivative is changing signs at only one x value, then there has to be an absolute extreme at that x value. Um, so if you don't really believe me, let me actually go ahead and show you the test for this problem, and then we'll reason out why it actually works. So, for example, here we see that g prime, which is really f, is greater than 0 or positive between negative 4 and negative 1. And we also see that g prime is at least uh, less than or equal to 0 from negative 1 to 3. I can't say less than 0 because right here at x equals 1, g prime is exactly 0, but at least less than or equal to, so non-increasing. Um, so based off of this, I'm claiming that therefore g has an absolute max at x equals negative 1. Let's go back and reason out why this has to be true. So f greater than 0, or g prime greater than 0, we're saying our function, our g function is increasing until we get to negative 1. So that means that any of the values before we get to negative 1 can't be the max. And we're also saying that our function is either uh, decreasing or holding steady after we get to negative 1. Um, so that means we never get anything higher than whatever that value was at negative 1. 
Um, so therefore, negative 1 has to be the location of our absolute max. So this is a cool way to do it without using the candidates test. Um, having said that, it does have a drawback. If you actually need the max value, you're still going to need to calculate g of negative 1. So it may or may not save you time. It's kind of a case-by-case -case basis for this one. So that's it for graphical analysis. Till next time, Mr. Sutton signing off.